Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 263, I chat with speaker designer Andrew Jones about his new designs for ELAC America. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded July 9th, 2015, episode 263. Andrew Jones, new ELAC speakers. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of absforum.com. This week's returning guest is Andrew Jones, now Vice President of Engineering at ELAC America. Hey, Andrew, welcome back to the show. Hi, Scott. Thanks for inviting me back. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, those who are watching live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Andrew as we go, and I will pass along as many as I can. Now, Andrew, the last time we spoke on this show, you were working for Pioneer, and you had developed some truly remarkable budget speakers, budget-level speakers that performed way above their price class. So what happened between then and now? You're, you're now not working for Pioneer anymore. I was made an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah, I've been with Pioneer for 17 years, and it had been wow. a remarkable time. I never imagined when I joined that it uh, I would be with them that long. But I am a kind of a, a long-term guy in, in what I do. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And particularly with the opportunity to start the TAD uh, consumer audio division. Mm -hmm. But Which, you know, and TA, TAD was a, a, a division of Pioneer, just to make sure everybody knows, uh, that, that where you focused on really high end, I mean, at the complete opposite end of the price spectrum from the speakers that you did for Pioneer, uh, but that just goes to show your versatility at being able to address both ends of that spectrum. <laughs> That's right. The entry-level speaker currently for TAD is uh, $24,000 a pair. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite okay. a bit so, different from the pioneers. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so there you were for 17 years, uh, happily designing speakers, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And you know, things are changing at Pioneer, and uh, the home division um, got sold to uh, Onkyo. So it's now at Onkyo and Pioneer together doing that. TAD remains unchanged. That continues. That was outside of that uh, exchange. But, um, you know, I for a while, I'd been approached from various directions as to would I be interested in doing anything else. And you know, I considered that after 17 years, maybe it's time for a change. And uh, ELAC approached me. ELAC are going through a revitalization and they had a wish to re-enter uh, or more visibly uh, enter the US market. Mm -hmm. And um, so we struck a deal to set up a design division here. So design and uh, development and marketing and sales, uh, a US division of ELAC. And um, that's what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very exciting because it's uh, just like when I first joined Pioneer, it's a clean sheet of paper and let's decide what we want to design. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you mentioned in the intro about the entry-level bookshelves that I'd done for Pioneer. And I thought that was a good place to start because if I start at the high end, it's going to take me another three years. <laughs> before I, I even introduced my prototype probably. That's how it kind of happened with DAD. And so... Um, I decided let's kind of do what I was doing with the entry level and try and surprise everyone again. And that's yeah. what uh, I'm attempting to do. Well, tell us a little bit, before we get into the speakers that you're designing now, let's uh, tell us a little bit about ELAC. I mean, I remember that name, that brand, uh, from, I don't know, must be 30, 40 years ago. 
uh, with turntables in the United States. But that's not all they do or even did back then. You're in that sweet spot. You can remember 30 or 40 years ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say, those who lived through the 60s, who remember the 60s did not live through them. Uh, I barely remember the 60s, and I did live through them, but in any event. <laughs> so, yes, I, ELAC as a company was founded uh, 89 years ago. And wow, doing, 89 uh, years ago? Yes, but not doing hi-fi, doing acoustics, uh, sonar-type applications. Really? Um, but the turntable business started in the 50s, um, late 40s, early 50s. And, mm -hmm. of course, over here in the U.S., they're remembered for the Miracord um, turntables, which were a serious competitor to other uh, manufacturers like Jewel and um, established their name over here. And it wasn't until much later uh, they started doing loudspeakers. But certainly uh, they, they even have a patent for the first moving coil stereo cartridge. And a no lot of companies kidding. such as Shaw um, licensed their patent for manufacturing stereo moving, coil, uh, moving huh. magnet cartridges. Wow. Wow. What do you know? Yeah. Uh, but they're also, they're also known in, the, in Europe anyway for, for speakers and have been for a long time, right? Yes, so for the last 20, 30 years, they've been primarily a loudspeaker manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are well known for their jet tweeter, which is uh, a development from the Heil Air Motion Transformer oh, technology. Yeah. And so you'll see in pretty much every speaker that they do, they've got one form or another of that jet tweeter. Mm -hmm. Which just for people who might not be familiar with the Heil Air Motion tweeter it's uh, uh basically a uh like an accordion almost uh, a, a folded ribbon tweeter that that vibrates and pushes air in and out right yes an accordion is a, a very good analogy as the accordion squeezes in and out the pleats will squeeze air laterally away mm -hmm. from the pleats and that's exactly how uh, a jet tweeter or high layer motion tweeter works mm -hmm. it has a, a a conductive track meandering back and forth up and down the pleats and they pull together and squeeze apart and mm -hmm. force the air out. So the, the transformer part is that the air velocity coming out is higher than the uh, lateral air velocity of the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So for those of you with a physics degree, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> like me. <laughs> like you and me, actually. Both, both of us uh -huh. have degrees in physics, so that's... Uh, <laughs> A good starting point, I would say, to all this stuff. Uh, and so does Arnie Nodell, who started uh, Infinity. Oh, no kidding. Oh, I didn't know that. What do you know? I, I was on a speaker panel at uh, the Newport Beach show, and Arnie was introduced as a laser physicist. So I oh, said, oh, wow. We have, we have two things in common. We're both speaker designers, and we're both physicists. Although, in my uh -huh. case, I was a lazy physicist. <laughs> <laughs> a lazy physicist, yes. <laughs> I remember in one, one class when the chalkboard was covered with equations and I was going, hmm, am I going to be able to get this later? But that's another story. <laughs> um, so now you're at ELAC and, uh, or at the new division called ELAC America and you've set up an office there and you're starting to design new speakers. Um, yes. And we, we saw the first of them at the show, the home entertainment show there in Newport a month or so ago now it must be. Uh, and I have to tell you, Whenever I was walking down the halls and I ran into somebody I knew and I said, what, what should I go here? What's, what's really good? Almost everybody said, you must go to the ELAC room. Yes, that was a very nice reaction. I was very happy about that. Uh, I must say those were the first of the new series that I designed. So they're the only working pair that I had. Everything mm -hmm. else was in static display in the adjacent room. But mm -hmm. I um, tried to make sure I got those working for the show, it would have been embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, as I usually do, I spend you know two days moving them around the room every which way uh, until I got that sweet spot. And that's, you know, no matter how good the equipment is, what matters is how well it's set up. And so I wanted to make sure that I could get the best possible setup. And by the time I got it maneuvered into the locations that I did in that room, I... I have to say, I was very pleasantly surprised by what 
uh, I was able to get out of it in that environment. So I was very excited to be able to show that to everybody else. Yeah, and, especially, uh, yeah, especially in, a, in a hotel room, which is rarely very good. <laughs> It's rarely very good, but then you look at a lot of rooms and they're rarely very good to start with. Mm, of course, true. the difference between with it, a hotel versus your home is you have months or years to optimize <laughs> a room at home, not two days. Um, yeah. But uh, yes, you just have to and spend time and, and You just have to spend the, the time. Yeah. And what was most remarkable to me, um, I mean, you know, your reputation precedes you, and I knew they were going to sound really good. But everybody I talked to said, you must go hear the ELAC room and the new Andrew Jones speakers. And what was it more remarkable to me even than that was the fact that these are entry-level speakers. They're, uh, the bookshelves you were showing called the B5, and we'll, I want to mention these model numbers in a minute because it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, our bookshelf speakers, uh, and they, what is the list price on them? $229 a pair. $229 a pair. And this at a show where, you know, there were many, many rooms with speakers in the five and six figure range. Um, and everybody was saying, you must go hear these $230 a pair speakers. <laughs> it just, it just blew me away. And then you go and listen to them and you go, Yeah. No wonder everybody's pointing this way. Uh -huh. So tell us, tell us a bit about the line of speakers uh, and and what what makes them distinctive. Well, to begin with, was why are we doing this? Leo, I already mentioned that to start off with a high end speaker, it'd be years before I <laughs> ever yeah. finished anything, which is why I have um, Chris Walker working with me because he makes sure I do finish things. <laughs> <laughs> Engineers don't finish things. Um, but uh, we decided to do entry level, but to step up from what I had done with the Pioneer speakers for two reasons. I wanted to do something a bit better. And why compete with myself? Those other products are still out in the marketplace. Um, and people have been, they keep asking me, when are you going to do something a bit more expensive or a little more, more expensive? You know, keep on going. And so... Mm -hmm. My starting point was uh, the next step up in uh, price. And it enables me to play more with the sound quality to get better materials and better design into it. Um, and so we started with a five inch bookshelf and then on static display, there's a six inch bookshelf. It'll be a five inch three driver floor stander and center channel and some subwoofers, which I'll, I'll get into later. Yeah, definitely. Um, but that extra money enabled me to uh, play with cone materials, for example, uh, to get better performance. And it was also, with a fresh start, it's a chance to think afresh about what ideas I tried before and how I might want to change them as I move forward. You know, you always learn... Uh, those entry levels were one of the lowest cost speakers I'd designed. And uh, you know, I, I learned a lot from doing that. They were already in their second generation. Uh, now I wanted to think a, a bit differently about some of the design approaches I'd got and um, try and re-optimize my thoughts and my designs. Mm hmm Let's so, take a quick look at let's take a quick look at the pictures yeah. before before you go on here. We have uh, the F5, which is the floor standing speaker, has five, um, uh, three rather five inch or five and a quarter inch drivers, uh, and and the, these model numbers are great. Instead of being all complicated, they're simply F for floor standing, five for the size of the driver, uh, or the larger driver. Okay, then we have the B5 and B6, uh, which basically look the same. Uh, I forget whether this is the B5 or the B6, but... Um, well, it looks like you the know, five to me, yes. Looks like the five, okay, probably yeah. so. Uh, C5 has two of those five-inch woofers in it with a tweeter in the middle, and we're going to talk about these drivers more, more specifically. Uh, and then there's the A5, which I found very interesting. This is the Atmos module, basically designed to be placed on top of either, I guess, the B5, B6, or F5 uh, to yes. supply that up-firing, 
uh, at reflecting off the ceiling Atmos sound. Although uh, it's actually the A4 technically. So oh no, my my <laughs> mistake. I have my, my my notes are wrong. Then thank you for uh, correcting me. We we made that mistake as well. <laughs> <laughs> In the naming of it, because if it's following convention, it's a four-inch driver in there. So. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to talk to you. We're, we're going to talk about the drivers here yeah. in a minute. But before we do, let, let me start with the fact that when you look at all these pictures and you compare them with the Pioneers that you made, mm -hmm. um, you see that the cabinets are all rectilinear. That is, they're all basically rectangular shaped rather than curved. Uh, what led you yes. to that decision? Well, uh, first thing was uh, looking at the marketplace. And when we uh, launched the Pioneer speaker with the curved cabinets, it was because partly the, at that price point, there were no other curved cabinets on the market. So it gives you uh, a distinctive look as soon as you go into the store. Mm -hmm. And that matters. People look, people listen with their eyes first. Uh, <laughs> Listen with their eyes. That's good. Yeah. I like it. And so uh, it certainly looked different on the shelves. And then it was also trying to get a, a performance advantage. Um, I was going to ask if the if the curved sides and the non rectilinear inner cavity gave you a performance advantage. Well, if you look at conventional thinking about uh, curved sided cabinets versus flat sided. Every cabinet resonates to some degree and colors the sound. So as you move up in price point, you can do more and more to build a, a rigid, resonant-free box. But at lower price points, you, you're stuck with some character from the box. And you'll obviously try and minimize that. So curve, all of the things being equal, a, a curved-sided panel has got greater stiffness than a flat panel. But you're still putting it with a flat top, flat bottom, flat front, flat back. So it has some uh, performance advantage in terms of stiffness. Not tremendous, uh, but some. In terms of what standing ways inside the enclosure, yes. conventional wisdom says that either non-parallel sides or uh, curved sides will eliminate standing waves. Well, of course, it does nothing of the sort. It modifies the standing waves and um, reduces the skew a bit, but it certainly doesn't eliminate them. The best way to deal with um, internal standing waves is damp them out with absorbent material. Mm. But nonetheless, to some degree, it gives a performance advantage. But you pay for that. The manufacturing cost of a curved-sided cabinet is much greater than with uh, a regular square cabinet. Um, it's more difficult to make the curved panel to begin with, and then constructing the cabinets more difficult, and then finishing it, putting the, the vinyl on it, is hand done rather than machine done with the wrap before you fold it in a square-sided cabinet. So you've got costs and quality control issues involved with that. And when you're doing an entry-level speaker, it is all about the cost. How do I spend this money? And I've said this over and over again, it's the art uh, of evaluating every penny and where it goes to and getting that optimum blend. So I thought I'd go back and look at the cabinet and see, uh, okay, with this new series, if I go for a curved sided cabinet, what's it going to cost me? And unfortunately, times have moved on, cabinets more expensive and curved sided cabinets are certainly more expensive. And so I was going to take a bigger hit for a curved sided cabinet than I had previously. So the first thing is to say, what does that get me? If it's going to cost me more proportionally in the overall design, what does it get me compared to now rethinking and spending that money differently? So I looked at the characteristics of the cabinet resonances. And yes, although it is a bit stiffer, it moves the resonant frequencies of the panel resonances upwards, it certainly doesn't move them out of the critical listening band. And so it's like asking what flavor would you like? <laughs> What's your favorite ice cream? Well, it's chocolate. Oh, no, it's strawberry. It's it, what flavor of resonance would you like? And when I looked at it that way, I realized that it's not moving it out of trouble. It's just giving you a different kind of cabinet resonance. A different so, kind of trouble. Y yes. And so uh, what if I went back to flat panels 
and um, by playing with the different thicknesses of front baffle, back baffle, and the side panels, can I get a performance that's going to uh, still work, but give me the freedom to spend my money elsewhere? Mm. And elsewhere means upping the performance of the drivers. So when I started developing, and of course, uh, from a looks point of view, I, I've been able to also spend a bit of money on the look. So although it's now back to a square-sided box, um, in English parlance, I've tarted it up a bit. <laughs> so, um, I've made it look more contemporary. Uh, I got a bit of European styling influence into there because yeah, we're, we're part of ELAC. It's going to be distributed, whereas the Pioneers were primarily distributed in the US. Uh, and... Uh, a, a little distribution worldwide. This is going to have large distribution in Europe as well. And uh, so I wanted to make it look a, a bit fresher. Um, but once I started examining it, I realized I've now got uh, a lot more money I can spend on the drivers. I can just start from scratch with the driver development. Mm. And so yeah. that's what I chose to do. Excellent. We're going to talk about those drivers in a minute, but first I got a question or two from the chat room. One of which is from UJ, who asks, did you have to be careful with your ELAC speakers, speaker design to avoid uh, violating, you know, any copyrights or intellectual property uh, of the work that you did for Pioneer? No, not at all. Uh, there was nothing proprietary in what I'd done with the Pioneer designs. Mm. And, uh, you know, this new design is totally new. You know, every drive unit, obviously the cabinet is very different. The drive units are very different and still known technology. It's just the careful appliance of that technology and the, mm. the blending that makes for good performance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I started it from scratch once I left Pioneer. It wasn't as if I was secretly <laughs> designing <laughs> on the side while I was there. That would definitely be a no-no. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's just surprised some people how quickly I've come up with these designs. But of course, yeah, I, I left Pioneer um, in February. No, January, I think. January, maybe. And uh, it's been about four months to the point of showing the prototype. Mm -hmm. um, now, that prototype was pretty much ready for production. But it was just that one model. That's the first one I'd actually put together and started listening to. You know, I developed all the drive units for everything, but I hadn't developed crossovers or voiced it and done any of that work. Um, so that was practical to achieve within four months. But then, since then, I've been madly, madly uh, developing and finishing everything else and getting it ready for production. And the so entire it's, it's line, a, by the way, the entire line is called the debut line, which makes perfect sense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, another question... Keep, as I yes. keep saying, until it makes some money, it's the debit series. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, Lawn Dog asks, are you going to put your name on these speakers as a logo like you did at Pioneer? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> not going to miss that trick. <laughs> yeah, really, don't miss that trick. <laughs> All right, Lawn like Dog. You... And on the back, it will say uh, debut series or something like that by Andrew okay. Jones. Just yeah, not my signature. Good. Pioneer have oh. my signature. Ah, can, there you go. Pioneer has rights to that signature. So, okay. Uh, Donnie asks, uh, how would uh, the B6 pair with a vintage receiver, such as the Pioneer SX380, uh, 380, I'm sorry, 838. Um, and that, I guess, leads to the question of what is the nominal impedance of these speakers? Right. The nominal impedance is 6 ohms. And... They are uh, minimum. I, I, whenever I quote a nominal impedance, I really do make sure that it meets the international standard, which is that the minimum impedance must not drop below 80% of the nominal impedance. So mm. for a 6 ohm system, that means 4.8 ohms. And it only reaches that 4.8 ohms uh, pretty much at one over one frequency range, which is around the 150 hertz region. Even at the port tuning frequency, it, it's above that value. And everywhere else, throughout the lower mid, upper mid treble, it's 8, 9, 10 ohms. So it's a very in, 
easy impedance to drive. Mm -hmm. So an older uh, vintage receiver or amplifier should have no trouble. Exactly. You need a reasonable amount of power. I've, I've not gone for out and out efficiency with this. You know, I have been questioned about this on the forums as to you know, why do I go for the lower efficiency? Mm -hmm. And partly uh, receivers or amplifiers these days, power is a lot cheaper than it used to be. So that's not really a limiting factor as long as the impedance isn't awkward. And then when you go for vintage, like we were saying, they were not so able to drive low impedance, awkward loads. So um, although I'm a bit limited in efficiency, I've made it easy to drive from a current point of view. And I go for the lower efficiency because, once again, I want to make sure that most of the speakers in the range are suited not just for home theatre, but for stereo, to make mm. this all stereo system. And uh, to that end, I want to make sure they've got reasonable bass performance. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you heard from lots of people at the show, they did remarkably well for the bass performance. Yeah, you just had these, you had these two bookshelves and no subwoofer, and you were playing a wide range of material with plenty of bass in it. It was, it was incredible. Yes, and a lot of that, of course, was down to room setup. I made sure that they worked uh, optimally for that. But nonetheless, it showed that it can be done. You can get remarkable bass performance out of them. And uh, that means for a stereo system, you're not relegated to having to try and integrate a subwoofer into the system. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking about material, Donnie asks, uh, what is your favorite rock pop CD or LP to audition your speakers with? I wouldn't have a favorite, well, there's a difference between favorite rock pop to listen to and, and what to evaluate. Ah, very good. Um, Excellent. You know, I, I've got some, I often play some Super Tramp that I've got in high res. Um, I've got some other music that's not readily available, but I know something about the uh, process with was involved in recording it. Mm. So it's a whole manner of things that I use. Um, okay, well, let's talk about those drivers then, because that's where you ended up putting the development money that you had, uh, mm. diverting it from the cabinets and the curved cabinets and so on to uh, the drivers themselves. Um, let's start with the, uh, maybe with the woofer, and we have a picture of, of the woofer in an exploded format to show while you're talking about that? Okay. So uh, the range, it, the B5. And you can see there uh, that the cone looks a bit rippled. The difference between this and what I did before, before was a, a rippled polypropylene cone. Here it's a, a full woven aramid fiber cone. And I've done that because I, you know, an aramid fiber cone Kevlar in popular ter uh, terms, but mm -hmm. uh, technically it's woven aramid fiber. And that has better strength to weight ratio than polypropylene. It costs more, but that's where I chose to spend money. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's better damped and has an overall better characteristic for uh, giving me the sound uh, performance that I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, it's a larger voice coil than I used before and is larger than typically used on a speaker in this price point and category. So it's an inch and a half voice coil. So that requires a, a bigger magnet um, with more drive, but it gives me better bass performance, more dynamics in the bass. And mm -hmm. combined with a, a new surround shape to optimize the excursion capabilities of that, which is why it was able to produce the, the bass that it did without getting into obvious trouble Either that right. or I was able to hide that from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you did hide it, it was very effective hiding, yes. Um, uh, I remember you saying at the show that you use, the magnet that you use is so, you basically used as large a one as you could possibly use that would fit through the hole in the cabinet. <laughs> yes, that, that is part of the art of speaker design. <laughs> Assembly that can actually be manufactured. <laughs> uh, right. You, know, you can do almost anything as a prototype, but it's got to be able to be put together. And yes. 
clearly one of the prerequisites of that is that it fits through its own hole. So, uh, <laughs> and yet you yes, you that, made that, sure that that speak that that magnet was as large as possible to fit through that hole. Well, you know, it's not as large as possible in that sense. It's as large as is needed to do the job. People uh, okay. like to talk about uh, oversized. It seems to be an expression commonly used over here. Oversized, oversized magnets. Mm -hmm. um, hey, this is America. We like our everything <laughs> oversized. Supersized magnet. Yeah, I'll have to change the yeah. supersized magnet. That's that. It's a supersized magnet. There you go. Um, but that only. It, you're doing optimum design. There is an optimum amount of motor strength for a given cone area and moving mass that will give you the correct base alignment in a cabinet. Put on two little magnet, you get the wrong base alignment. Put on two bigger magnet, you get a lot the wrong base huh. alignment. So okay. it's, That's in reality, it's an optimum size magnet. It just <laughs> happens that it just fits through its own hole. <laughs> If it didn't, I would have to be really rethinking uh, the whole design of that drive unit. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lawn Dog in the chat, chat room is asking, uh, what material are you using for the surround foam material? So it's a, a kind of rubberized plastic type material, a santoprene type material. So it's not going to mm. rot or suffer from UV problems. Um, and you can play around with the effective stiffness of the material that you use because it has to do multiple jobs. It has to uh, terminate the standing waves in the cone correctly. It has to allow things to move without adding too much stiffness. It also has to resist back pressure in the cabinet from when it's moving in and out. And so a uh, combination of shape and materials and thickness all contribute to giving you the characteristics that you need. And that's one yeah. of the things as you're playing around with drive units during the development phase. Uh, just trying new surrounds until you get the characteristic that you want. A number of people in the in the chat room are talking about surrounds having a limited lifespan uh, and and degrading and disintegrating over time. I've seen that in older speakers. You're saying that that's not going to be a problem with these. Absolutely, in older speakers. Well, let's decide how old. Really <laughs> old speakers didn't disintegrate so much because they were doped cloth corrugated surrounds. Mm. Even earlier than that, they might have had pressed paper surrounds, and those could eventually fatigue. Uh, but with the cloth ones, they never did. Uh, but then we got this idea of going to uh, foam. And the foams in those days were really sensitive to UV light. So after a few years of exposure, yes, they would turn to dust. And you'd be left with it flapping in the wind. So... Um, we all learned our lessons from that. From the seventies, um, eighties was when foam surrounds were popular, and mm. there are now formulations of foam surrounds that are much more rugged and don't degrade in the way the old ones do. But it's got a bad rap, and you know, there are certain reasons why you'd want to use foam sometimes. But um, with the modern santoprene type uh, synthetic rubber materials, then it gives close to the best of all worlds for the characteristics. Mm -hmm. And they will, mm -hmm. they will not degrade. Um, any other uh, highlights you want to talk about the woofer driver? Anything else that's uh, well along you came with, up with? The, along with the bigger um, voice coil diameter, it enabled me to put a larger vent hole through the pole piece. You know, mm. every cone has a dust cap on it pretty much, unless you have the ones with the face plug on the front. And that dust cap is pushing air back pass the coil into the magnet system unless you do some kind of venting. And the optimum way to do the venting is through the pole piece. But a small hole isn't doing much. It'll make chuffing noises if you play it to a higher level. So I was able to get a much larger diameter vent hole and relieve that back pressure underneath the um, dust cap. So that mm. worked very well for the, the base performance. Speaking of venting, let's talk about the, the fact that these speakers are ported rather than sealed. And we have an exploded view of the B5 to show that porting um, that, that we can take a look at. And uh, what, was your, what was your design approach to the ported cabinet? Well, we're both physicists. You can't Indeed. get around the laws of physicists, physics, right? <laughs> so, 
As Scotty uh, from Star Trek said, you cannot change the laws of physics. Of physics. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to, you are constrained by that. And uh, there is a famous equation uh, that puts the box size, the bandwidth, and the efficiency into uh, an equation that says, if I pick two, I'm forced to have the other. So you can't have a small box and high efficiency and extended base response. Pick mm. two of them, then the other is given to you. <clears throat> right. Much the, the same, close... much the same as the, the general rule of life, which is uh, good, cheap, and fast. Pick any two. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, now you can kind of cheat by there's a difference between uh, what you can get out of a closed box system versus a vented box. A vented box gives you a bit more to play with and it gives you uh, the capability of, for a given size box uh, and efficiency, uh, having uh, a bit better base extension, for example. It, so you have an advantage there at the expense of when it does start rolling off, it rolls off faster than a closed box does. But mm. in the region, in the cutoff range, the vented box has very usefully extra output capability and a flatter response. And so uh, in a entry-level speaker, I, I think that's important. And so I go for a vented box design. Mm -hmm. But you've got to design it right. You, know, you can easily mistune a vented box system and then it has uh, a sound that people will say, oh, it doesn't sound as good as a closed box. Uh, <laughs> um, but you can it's make all in it the design. It's all in the details there, I'm sure. Yes, it is, yes. Uh, did we, John, did we ever pick, get the uh, B5 exploded view? Wanted to, to just show people that real quick. Um, if it's around, if not, then we will move on. I don't see but, it, so <laughs> there it is. Yay! Yes. Okay, so now, here we see the exploded view of the B5 uh, with its vent and uh, the crossover down there near the bottom, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Right, and... Uh, yeah, I, I will, when I when we come to talk about the subwoofers, um, I'll talk about vented versus passive radiators as well. But ah, the other good. feature to look at in this speaker is the, the tweeter. Uh, yes. Entirely new tweeter again, uh, in a waveguide, but a deeper waveguide than I used before. So that gives me better directivity control, better efficiency. And one of the advantages of waveguides, not only does it, more closely align the acoustic centers of the voice coils of the tweeter and the woofer. But it also sh kind of shields the tweeter radiation from the effects of baffle diffraction at the edges of the cabinet. Mm. You know, a, a tweeter mounted ex precisely on the surface of the cabinet will have maximum diffraction from the edges of the cabinet. And so you see that in the on-axis response. And this kind of ameliorates some of that. So it has... A and I, we have an exploded view of the tweeter that we can take a look at as well. If, uh, if uh, John can pull that up, then we yeah. will see it. Here it is. Uh, so yeah. here we have the, uh, the tweeter and, and the waveguide right next to the actual diaphragm, which is that little, little uh, bump in the center of... It's close to the middle of this picture, right? Yeah. And what's interesting there, this is actually an old one. I've since changed it because when I was... <laughs> <laughs> wow, this. you move fast. You'll see the screws that hold the waveguide through to the magnet structure, and they go into these pockets in that waveguide. Would you believe those pockets produce a 3 dB dip at 10K? No kidding. <laughs> and I wow. discovered that as I was swapping things around. So I ended up um, changing how I put that whole tweet to, together so it doesn't rely on those screws holding it together so that mm -hmm. I could remove those pockets and get a smoother response from the tweeter. Hmm. So it's all about optimizing every little detail uh, without spending money. Indeed. <laughs> um, there was a question uh, a little bit back here uh, in the chat room about the tweeter. Um, let me see if I can find it. Oh, Mahler Music asked, uh, why, use the, why the use of cloth dome when ELAC has great air motion tweeters? Uh, as, as we mentioned before, why, why did you go with a a dome tweeter, first of all, and why the cloth material? Well, a dome tweeter as opposed to the jet tweeter, because of the cost of the jet tweeter. Mm. You, know, you can get jet type of tweeters at very low cost these days, and that's what they sound like. <laughs> very low cost. <laughs> you get what you <laughs> yeah, pay for, huh? You certainly do. 
penny for penny at the lower price points, uh, I find that a, a, a good dome tweeter will outperform a, a low cost jet style tweeter. Mm. Um, ELAC have spent you know, years and years optimizing jet tweeters to get the best performance out of them. And it costs money to manufacture it in that way. So that's going to be reserved for some of the uh, later speakers that we'll be doing. Uh, you know, I am going to integrate more and more with the engineering group over in Germany, and we'll see some uh, higher-end speakers coming out. But for now, it's uh, dome tweeters and cloth dome because, again, at entry-level price points, it's easier to get good performance out of a, uh, an optimized cloth dome than it is from, a let's say, a metal dome. Hmm. You know, I've used metal domes, obviously, in the beryllium tweeters that I did for TAD. They work extremely well, and you can't, <laughs> you can't afford a beryllium, certainly. They're and really as you go to, expensive, yeah. Yeah, and if you go to aluminum, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to get a good performance out of an aluminum tweeter. So, okay. again, that may, might come along, but for now, cloth. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawn Dog in the chat room is asking, uh, what is the power handling of these speakers? What is the so wattage these range? At 120 watts, continuous. Mm -hmm. um, is that continuous? Um, no. That's peak. Ma max power. Mm -hmm. um, but the way we test them, we test them for 100 hours at uh, our continuous power rating, which is about one third of the max power. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Your amplifier would be burning up if you run it at that kind of continuous power for a long time. Um, so they'll easily take you know, 120 watts, um, certainly from music, uh, typical music spectra. So mm -hmm. it, it's quite respectable. Um, and, yeah, certainly I've not right. had any problem playing as as people who attest at the show. They could play really loud and not get into difficulties. Right. What What is the efficiency rating? So it's uh, 85 dB on the... Sensitivity, more, more, sensitivity. more exactly, precisely, yes. yeah. Uh, so 6 ohm, 85 dB. Mm -hmm. um, which is, if you think in terms of, uh, if a speaker was a 4 ohm, then it would be equivalent to about uh, 86 dB uh, without cheating. So it's just getting that right balance mix between sensitivity and impedance. Mm -hmm. And certainly 85 dB per watt is, I mean, it, it, playing 85 dB seems perfectly loud enough to me, and that only requires one watt. Yes, I I think people can get caught up a bit too much in uh, what the sensitivity figures are because in mm. practice uh, you very rarely play at the full loudness capability uh, that the speaker is able to achieve, and certainly on a continuous you know listening all day long basis, and mm -hmm. for short periods you're not running into difficulties anyway, and. You know, power is cheaper th these days, as I said earlier. So 85 dB, it's okay. On a switch over, you'll go, oh, that's a bit quieter. But get it home, start playing it, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Uh, Lawn Dog asks, so uh, what about the stuffing material or the damping material inside the speaker? Uh, that's a bonded acetate fiber type material. Um, and I've just play been playing around with the location of that in the enclosure. Mm -hmm. um, because location affects how it uh, does the standing waves. But yeah, bonded acetate fiber. Mm -hmm. F-Loop asks, there appear to be no distortion-reducing shorting rings or copper caps in the driver motors. Are they just not in the budget? How much quality is lost without them? Correct. It's actually how much quality do you gain by having them? <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's put it that way. Because let's, let's, let's ask the question in the right way. Okay. It's generally reserved for more expensive speakers. It costs more to either copper plate uh, with a, you know, a, you need about at least a millimeter thickness of copper to get the best effects. And it only starts affecting things in the mid band. It does not improve bass distortion. So I've certainly optimized from a coil geometry and position uh, for bass distortion. But through the mid band, yeah, it doesn't have copper because you're going to lose by, you have to open up the gap to give enough room for the copper to go in because the optimum position to put that material is actually in the gap. There are shorting rings that can go outside the gap, but they're not optimum. 
they, they help, but they're not the optimum way to do it. Uh, if you open up the gap, you need a bigger magnet to force more flux through the bigger gap. And we, as we've already pointed out, a bigger magnet wouldn't actually fit. So, right. um, <laughs> yeah, uh, at this price point, it would be a very expensive option to incorporate that. Wouldn't, wouldn't really be practical to incorporate at this price point. You'd have not to increase... how it's not how I'd spend my money. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Eric Duckman asks, uh, venting front versus rear on the cabinet. Uh, vented rear. Yeah, but, um, and, and I guess the question really is, wh what's the advantage of rear versus front? So uh, every cabinet will still have some standing waves, and the vent is basically an open hole for the standing waves. So if you have the vent facing forward, you'll not only hear whatever internal standing waves you have inside the box kind of come out directly to you. You'll also hear more readily any vent chuffing. Um, so by putting it around the back, you minimize the audibility of both of those effects. But don't, you, you also, don't you also then, uh, aren't you more restricted in terms of placement? I mean, if you put such a speaker with a rear vent right up against the wall, you could run into problems there too, right? Yes. So if you get it too close to the wall, it will um, reinforce perhaps a bit too much. So that is the downside of doing it that way. But overall, I think it's a worthwhile balance, particularly since if you really get it too close to the wall, because you've got so much extra boundary reinforcement, it just so happens that the difference between a, a vented box uh, alignment and what it would perform like if you blocked the vent and used it as a closed box, that difference in shape is not too different from the boundary reinforcement that you get. So hmm. the answer is, if you put it too close to the wall, put a sock in it. <laughs> <laughs> Any color that you want, just make sure the left and right are the same color sock. Because um, <laughs> that's going to affect the, the sound, of course. <laughs> and it helps with the laundry. You're not going to have now two uh, <laughs> socks. And that'll work quite nicely. Okay, very good. Excellent advice from the master himself. <laughs> Um, okay, here's uh, Kay Lu asks a question. Assuming the concave dust caps are an aesthetic concession to kids and idiots who like to poke them, uh, how much accuracy and dispersion do you lose from the standard dome design? Or is this a misconception? It's a misconception. Uh, the dome has only a small, if done right, only a small effect on the overall response once you've got some form of dome. Whether it's a concave or convex, doesn't really make much difference. And in, in some respects, an inverted dome can help in the way that it's bonded to the cone. It can help stiffen up the, that part of the voice coil former. Um, so it, it can be an advantage from that point of view. But in terms of dispersion, no, it makes very little difference. Um, okay, one question I have for you about the A4, now that I know that it's the A4. Uh, at Pioneer, your, your Atmos-enabled speakers you were quite uh, strong on concentric drivers for those up-firing yes. drivers. Is the same thing true here? Are you, are you using concentric drivers here? Yes, it will be a concentric driver. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know they're not ready yet. They're not done yet, but... Right. Um, and the advantage of that, just to reiterate, I know you spoke about that when we were talking about the Pioneers, but... So there's certain requirements for directivity control for that upward-firing driver in a Atmos enabled speaker system and it can fulfill that with a full range driver but a full range driver getting to work well over that frequency range is not easy uh, which is why there aren't many hi-fi full range drivers um, going to a concentric gets back to optimizing the tweeter and the mid-range to work optimally together but gives you the uh, added benefit of having the directivity requirements you need for atmos so that's why mm. i choose that route mm, okay uh, let's talk about the subs now. The, you, there are three yes. subwoofers, new subwoofers in the line. Uh, one is called the S10, and it's a pretty conventional subwoofer um, as far as that goes. But I'm more interested in the S10 EQ and the S12 EQ. Right. Uh, we, have, we have a photo uh, of the front and back of that sub, and I just want to show people here's the front. Um, it's got uh, a single driver, either a 10-inch or a 12-inch, uh, depending on the model number there. Uh, and the back of it is very interesting to me. And, you, and Chris points Where's all the out, controls? Where's all the controls? Where's all the inputs? 
there's no control there except for the power switch uh, yeah. and one input for the LFE channel. Um, yes. What the heck's going on there? So one of the problems with regular subwoofers is uh, it's forcing... Uh, you have phase control, level control, and frequency. And yep. they're a very limited subset of the kinds of controls you need to optimally blend a subwoofer with your satellite speaker. In addition, the subwoofer is interfacing into a room with all the standing waves in the room. So common now with most receivers on the market is some form of room EQ. And there's also aftermarket devices that can provide this. Mm -hmm. um, what we decided to do is integrate it all into the subwoofer itself. So, so the S10 EQ and the S12 EQ have onboard DSP processing to provide room EQ and the filtering necessary to match it to the satellite. But what's cool about it, that DSP processor um, allows you to tune out the room modes, but without needing an auxiliary microphone like you'll typically get when you have a receiver and you plug in a microphone, a long cable mm -hmm. out to the listening position, and then you go and trip over the cable <laughs> as I've done many <laughs> times around setting the system up and yep. pull yep. everything out. So it all works on low energy Bluetooth connection and works with a smartphone, Android or iOS. And uh, it automatically pairs as soon as you turn the things on and load up the program. And you use, what's cool is that you're using the uh, smart device to control the DSP processor to do all the EQ, but it's using the microphone built into your smartphone. Now, as wait the, a second. Right. So, how do you do that? Isn't it a how crappy do you do little that? microphone? Right. So, we've got a a neat trick. Uh, we essentially calibrate that microphone by knowing what the speaker should do. So the process is you load up the program, you start it running, then you go into the calibrate mode. And you bring the speaker up very close into the near field of the subwoofer. Now the, this the, is... The phone, you mean? The microphone? The, the mic Yeah, the microphone of the phone, you bring close to the into the near field of the subwoofer. Now, the near field response of the subwoofer is a known quantity. That's typically what we'll measure as we're designing a subwoofer. So we know what it does. We know what it that that is what we want the subwoofer to do. Now, will you will that near field uh, will you measure the near field response of each subwoofer as it comes off the assembly line, or, or will you apply something the same one to each one, assuming that they're close? Assume it's close. Subwoofers are actually able, it's much easier to get the performance of a subwoofer consistent than it is, mm. for example, a tweeter. So it's basically a known quantity. So what we now do is we measure the, that near field response. And it's modified by the effect of the microphone, but it doesn't matter because what we're going to now do is it remembers that measured response. We now remove the phone to the listening location and remeasure and then the dsp processor we can go through a, a routine that will apply up to 12 parametric eq filters to adjust the response as measured at the listening position to match the response we measured at the near field position ah so, so in other words putting the to... putting the phone near the near the in the near field and measuring the response through the phone gives you a, a delta or an offset from the really nice microphone you undoubtedly use to measure the near field response in the lab. But what it means is it doesn't matter what that microphone actually measures. Right. All we're trying to do is adjust that measurement to be the same in the listening position as it was in the near field. It takes the room out of the equation and says, I wanted the speaker to have this certain response. Unfortunately, the room modifies it. But now we're going to take out the room and the microphone response is immaterial, as long as it can measure with sufficient bandwidth, which mm -hmm. we've done those experiments and it can. So it's really cool. It obviates the need for an external microphone and it makes it a very simple setup procedure. Now, we have a couple of, couple of screenshots from that app I want to show everybody, the app on the... Uh 
iPhone or, or Android. Uh, he, so tell us what we're looking at here. Um, so that screenshot is just for um, some of the things you can do to control uh, the level of the sub output. Yeah, there that shows one of the filters. You can go through and change the the center frequency, the bandwidth, and the gain of the filter, positive and negative. So you can. This is, this is a band of parametric EQ. Exactly. And then mm -hmm. that next screenshot that's showing. Uh, the measured near field response and it's showing what it measured as that near field response and then it remembers that and then adjusts the in-room response until it matches what that near field response was. Mm. So it's a very, and there you can see the difference between the filters that it applied, but they're all right. the measured versus the um, optimized. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable actually that, that th this is a kind of a new paradigm. This is something that we haven't seen before, is it? Right. It, it's it's new and uh, we patented that process and it, it's very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're seeing that. And with the subwoofers themselves, uh, you saw that the uh, S10 EQ and the S12 EQ were front firing woofers, but they also mm -hmm. incorporate down firing passive radiators. Ah, um, tell us about that. So rather than vents... Uh, so uh, a vented box, as I said, is, gives a performance advantage over a uh, closed box, as long as the vent is quiet. But as you start to pump too much air through a vent, it starts to get noisy. You, know, you try and flare the ends to reduce turbulence, but at some point it's going to overload. And then it gets that horrible chuffing noise. Mm -hmm. um, so that was okay for the, within the parameters of what we designed for the S10, the entry-level sub. But as we go up in price point and performance, you can get quieter operation, let's say, by going to uh, a passive radiator. So passive radiator in its simple form is just a, a mass of diaphragm that matches the acoustic mass of the air. So if the compliance of the surround of that diaphragm is low enough, it performs almost exactly like a passive radiator, but without the airflow, the high airflow velocity that is forced out through the vent. So it's a, mm. a less noisy version. Now, does it matter if it, the, you said the, the passive radiator is down firing, so it's on the yes. bottom of the subwoofer? Does it matter if what, what floor material the subwoofer is placed on, for example, hardwood or tile versus carpet? Not at these very low frequencies. The, hmm. the peak output of the passive radiator is at the tuning frequency, so it's typically around 28, 25 hertz. So the material that's underneath is not going to largely affect that. And because the air velocity is quite low, then the, the tufts in the carpet are not going to try, kind of block anything. Change things. Okay. All right. Um, so what kind of prices are we talking about? You, you mentioned the B5 is uh, 229 230 a pair. Yeah. Um, what so are the, the S10 is 249 you're asking the and engineer. And that's, You're asking the yeah, wrong person. I'm, wrong, I'm, asking, you the, I'm asking the wrong guy. Sorry about that. <laughs> I believe that the S10, the entry level, is 249. So, so that's a 100-watt. Uh, uh, oh, good, good point. 100-watt sub with them. a 10-inch driver. And then yep. we go, the S10 EQ is 200 watts with a, a long throw, bigger magnet, 10-inch driver with passive radiator. Mm -hmm. And then uh, 500 watts continuous with a 12-inch drive and a 12-inch passive. And right. the price points, I think, uh, 249 449 People can look it up on... Something like something that. Something like that, yeah. People can look that up on, look on, our on the website, <laughs> elac.us. Uh, elac yeah. um, let's see. Uh, oh, Charlie X had a question here. Uh, how do you tailor the speakers to American ears? Or is there a difference between American ears and European ears, uh, Japanese ears, so on? I do not do any deliberate tailoring ever. For I, I design it for what I think is the sound that it should have, mm. um, no matter the price point. Um, so it's been proven over and over again with the designs I've done that, uh, yeah, they'll work in all sorts of markets. Now, if you want a different... If a particular market or some people in a different market want a particular flavor, I'm sure there's manufacturers that are already doing that flavor. You can't please everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you try and please everybody, you end up pleasing none. None. So, <laughs> uh, well, 
The yeah. uh, the other question that I wanted to ask you, you mentioned earlier that you, and you've said this before on the show, that uh, you tend to design speakers to perform well in two-channel mode with music uh, and figuring that, that that will carry over into a multi-channel surround type system. Yeah. Make, I want to make sure I'm, I'm paraphrasing you correctly. Yes, I, I think if you talk to most speaker engineers, they'll say that that's pretty much what they'll do. Uh, so many characteristics of what's important in reproducing music are also critical for uh, movies, vocal you know, dialogue, Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. You want the same clarity in that as you want for music, so you can understand what's being sung. Uh, many movies, well, nearly every movie has a soundtrack associated with it, and it's a critical part of the movie. If you listen to a movie, some movies that were made without music, it's a very different listening experience. Mm -hmm. And so music is an integral part of telling the story, the anticipation of what's coming by the way the music builds up in its... Uh, tempo or dynamics um, so music is critical there and uh, so the speaker should be able to produce music very well so there's very little difference between designing for movies and music other than perhaps with the subwoofers where you've got all these artificially generated low frequency signals the subwoofer has to be capable of doing the explosions that mm -hmm. kind of thing which is generally higher levels than uh, typically found in most music now, I've, uh, it's interesting, this particular question, I've, I've posted a poll this week on AVS asking, uh, can one audio system serve music and movies equally well? Um, and some people say no, that, that there are different requirements. For example, uh, as you mentioned, movies have a lot lower, have, have some very really low frequency LFE type effects. Many audiophiles like to have two full range speakers with no subwoofer. Um, what's your feeling on, on that particular question of can one system serve both purposes equally well? Obviously you can design a speaker to serve both purposes equally well, but how about in a room, in a system, playing those two different types of material? Well, there wanna be placement uh, limitations with a five channel system uh, that uh, force you into particular maybe compromises uh, which a two channel will you'll be using different compromises I think that in reality the best speaker is a full range speaker uh, rather than separating it out into a subwoofer but that means in a multi channel system you need five full range minimum five full range speakers and mm. obviously that's largely impractical to do, but it is the best approach to getting a home cinema system that will also produce music optimally. Mm -hmm. There's also the argument that the more subwoofers you spread around, the better in terms of evening out the uh, differences in sound in the different listening positions due to the standing waves in the room. And that's certainly true, but now we're set, we've got all the phase matching problems between whatever subwoofers you use and whatever satellites. So, Home theater can be a highly compromised system because of practicality, whereas a good stereo system, it's easier to get at least the speaker part of it working optimally, although then you're going to suffer that you've got to spend a lot more time finding the right location uh, for the subwoofer or for the speaker because you now got to optimize both the mid-band performance and the stereo imaging and all the traditional aspects of the sound. And the location of the speaker for that might not be the best location for getting the best bass performance when you're limited to two speakers. Mm. So there's, it's, as usual, there's no clear-cut answer. I'm an no. engineer. You, you'll never get yes or no from an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and that's totally fine. Life is, <laughs> life is much more complex than many would like it to be, I'm sure. Okay, last question. Uh, what can you tell us about what's coming up from your team at ELAC? Um, hopefully, hopefully a vacation for all of us once we get <laughs> into production. Um, but other than I that... I hope so too, definitely. We've got lots of product planned, uh, not just in speakers. You know, I'm going to be stepping up in price points of speakers and introducing new stuff, both at Rocky Mountain at, and at CES and at Munich next year. And... Uh, 
So speakers will be moving up and up in price point, but we are going to add some electronics as well. We've got some very exciting, interesting electronics to add. Mm. And that's all I'll say about that <laughs> for right now. <laughs> well, then <laughs> but, when the um, time comes, when the time comes, will you come back and uh, and share with us again what's what's new at ELAC? Absolutely, I will, yes. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's been a fascinating conversation, as always. Uh, that's Andrew Jones, um, a VP of Engineering at ELAC America, and you can find them at ELAC, E-L-A-C dot U-S. Andrew, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Scott, and thanks to everyone who's listened in. Uh, you can find me, of course, at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at HTGeekScott and at AVS Forum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash HTG and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, I have three guest geeks scheduled to be on the show. Uh, Stacy Spears, Derek Smith, and Joel Barsati, all from SpectraCal. And they've been doing a lot of work in the area of high dynamic range video. So we're going to hear about what that is all about. And it's one of my favorite subjects. And uh, I hope you find it of interest as well. So please join us. Until then, geek out. <laughs> <laughs>